It has been said that a lie could travel around the world before truth gets a chance to step its foot out the door. Now, I don't know if that's really true or not, because I just heard it today or yesterday. <laughs> I've heard something like that, I think, before. And it brings me to a point that is interesting that I find my own way of looking at that, whether it be accuracy or inaccurate, in this way. You can tell me something, but that doesn't mean I'm going to believe it. In other words, if I know better, why would I fall into that fallacy of falling for something that's not true? In other words, if you're familiar with the truth, you can't be lied to. And one of the things that you hear the expression of is that you can't cheat an honest man. Well, you know, I'll take that with a grain of salt. But I do know this as far as discernment is concerned. When I hear something that doesn't sound right, I don't believe it's right. Then I go and check and validate and find sources for the accuracy or inaccuracy of what I'm hearing. When it comes to the Word of God, I do that always. I trust in what God is having me to hear. Because the first thing that I question is whether or not the person that said it actually knows what they're talking about. They'll tell me like it's in the book of, oh, I don't know, James 6. You know, and I'll go, there's no chapter 6 of James because I happen to know that James has five chapters. At least I think it does, so maybe I better check. And to demonstrate that, because <laughs> I'm not sure now, is I think I'll go check. But you see, that's the point of why we're supposed to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. We're supposed to prove and approve things that are more excellent as well as to prove things that are true and accurate. So I remember I used to have a pastor who would actually do that. He would tell us things that were inaccurate. You know, like, um, I can't even think of one of the Psalms, but in this respect, he would say something like James 6. And I'm pretty sure that there's only five chapters to James, but we'll make sure. So we look in here and say, oh, there is a James chapter 6. Oh my God, I was wrong. <laughs> yeah, see, you don't know. <laughs> if you thought there was a James 6, you're out of your mind. There's only five chapters. <laughs> so you see, inaccurate information can also be misinformation sometimes. And that's being used a lot in the world today. Israel has always been famous for purposefully using misinformation in order to cause people to be kind of lulled into you know, a, a way of being less mindful of what they should be paying attention to and distracted from what actually they are doing beneath the scenes or behind the scenes. And it's kind of like a distraction, disinformation kind of technique that um, Israel likes to use a lot of. And they'll leak information to the news services or in our country sometimes that'll happen with reporters misrepresenting the information by putting this big, bold, giant headline on it and it says all kinds of weird stuff. And you look at the article, it doesn't have anything to do with the headline. Matter of fact, most of the time the headline has nothing to do with the article. But it catches your attention, it captures your eye, it gets tickling your ear. One of the things that happens a lot in Christianity, unfortunately, is the same principle. There's disinformation that is represented as misinformation. Meaning that people say things when they may have a good intention, but it really isn't accurate and it's not true. I mean, there's penny saved, penny earned. You know, we do the Benjamin Franklin thing with that all the time. People use that one because, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. Because at one point in time, it was fun to make up proverbial statements that applied to colloquialisms that we could use and say, you know, um, they're, they're a moral story that have a good ending that we should do that aren't directly from Scripture but have something that is good that indicates a topic of scripture. Well, you know, it sounds good at first, but then when someone else comes along and represents it as scripture, that's where the disinformation comes in. You see, disinformation takes away from the Bible as opposed to puts credit back into the Bible. 
Now, we can look at holiness and we can look at moral character and all these other things in the scripture and what they indicate to do. And then we could say cleanliness is an adaptive process of redemption by which you are being made clean from within to without with which God has removed the stain of sin from you and the stain of corruption to make incorruption so that you would one day appear before God in perfectly clean or holy and perfect in his image that he's done by working through you to accomplish his purpose. Now, it's not quite what you would say cleanliness is next to godliness, but it's scriptural. <laughs> and it doesn't fit at all. Because the cleanliness is next to godliness is not true. At all. As a matter of fact, it doesn't have anything to do with godliness. Cleanliness does not make you any more godly than dirtiness. <laughs> it may be an indicator of an issue, but it's not an indicator of godliness. And so that's where the disinformation and misinformation sometimes comes into factor, which you might have thought of as being, oh, well, it sounds right. It should be in there. If it's not in there, it's not right. And that's why we say truth, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am, not you are. It's not your intellect. It's not your intelligence. It's not your logic. It's not your you know, cutesiness. It's not your colloquialisms, it's not your cliche Christianity that's going to get you into heaven. As a matter of fact, the only thing that's going to get you into heaven is Jesus. Bottom line. And he already took care of it for you if you would adapt your own way of looking at it to realize that, hey, all you got to do is just ask him and he'll talk to you. I mean, get over your own pride and issues and you'll find out how simple salvation really is. Deal with it, you know. Try it, see if you like it. You don't, then fine, go to hell. <laughs> I mean, that's what I tell people. It's like, hey, why risk it? Try it. If it doesn't work, then don't do it. But if it works, hey, <laughs> whoa, you missed a close one, didn't you? Close shave. And that's my point about disinformation and misinformation. A lot of times people will try to make things sound better than they are in order to get people and deceive them into doing something that they should not be deceived in the first place because once they find out they were misled then they get fed up with what quote unquote the person did and leave all that the rest of what God wanted to do behind and that's why we're supposed to speak the truth in love we're supposed to be accurate according to what God has said not what man has said. Man will interpret till the cows come home. I mean, literally, he will. He'll, he'll reinvent and reinvent and reinvent and reinvent over and over and over and over and over and over and over again in order to kind of either feel important, look important, feel cleanliness, feel esteem, feel pride, feel ego, feel righteous, feel whatever. But the hardest part is when you get to something as simple like what Jesus said. Love your enemies. <laughs> That's kind of like blasting, right? You know, a blast from the past that kind of knocks you right on your, you know, and you have to sit down and think, huh? Whoa. Yeah. That's what it was meant to do. Because that's how simple God is. He wants to change you from what you think to what He is. Because what he is, is love. So if you could take love as the bottom line for every other thing that you ever do know, imagine, or think about God, then you would have a better idea of when people are giving you misinformation and disinformation about what Jesus is or what God is or what religion as Christianity is supposed to be. Because right now there's a whole lot of hunk of junk out there. There's a whole lot of fluff and stuff. There's a whole lot of puffed up people that say things like, you know, well, you got to be politically oriented. Well, no, you don't. Well, you got to get involved in this. No, you don't. You got to go be this. No, you don't. You got to join this party or be that party or be, you know, friends with this or friends with that and do this and do that. No, you don't. At all. As a matter of fact, one thing is required of you, and that's alone to be alone, quite frankly, with God. Because one day you will be alone with God 
face to face. You'll deal with him in a place where you're going to give an accounting for your life, you know, and hey, if you lived it your way, praise the Lord, you know, great, I'm happy for you. Give it to him and see what he does and says about it. Because whether you recognize, admit, or realize the fact of eternity, it's happening. It's going to happen. Your physical body will end, period, and it ain't going to be over. <laughs> Sad to say for some, because some really think it's going to be over, so they'll just go ahead and do whatever they want. But when you get older, you kind of realize, you know, there's got to be more to living than living, <laughs> more to life than life. There's got to be something more, you know. It just doesn't make sense, you know. How come this all just accidentally happened? And, you know, then you begin to kind of go, nah, you don't buy it. And then you kind of like start playing around with a bunch of games, you know, of intellectualism and, you know, socialism and all these weird things that you can get involved in to make yourself feel better about being scared to death because of death. When in reality, God said, hey, you could enjoy life because of life. You could enjoy your life now because you have eternity to come. You could be freed up from panic, anxiety, fear, death, disease, all these other things that you're terrified of because what's the worst it could do? Kill you? Ha! So what? You're going to live in eternity. Yeah. Big deal. And that's how the attitude can change when you have information as opposed to being told disinformation. When you have fact as opposed to having fallacy. When you are given the truth as opposed to misinformation. And that's why it's so important for people to use accuracy in their message, to use the truth in their message, because there's going to be people out there that don't want to hear what you have to say. They're going to go check it out on their own. They're only going to remember a few things that you said, a few things that you did. And those very few things may be the last thing that they have on their mind before they die. And it may be something that you might want it to, to be more important than what you think you have to say to them. Like, oh, I don't know, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness, or you got to go to church, or you got to do this, you know, you got to, got to, got to. And the person only remembers the goddess rather than the hoodoos. You know, the hoodoo. Who do you go to? Who do you deal with? Who do you, you know, hoodoos. And so, who do you reveal in your message? What do you reveal? How are you revealing it, you know? Stay away from disinformation and misinformation and misleading people because all it does is confuse the issue at hand, which really is simply one person with one God trying to figure out where they're going and what they're doing every day of their life. The reality is is that we're not doing that good a job of communicating that, or more people would be going, hey, if I could be freed up in order to live up what I'm living now, why wouldn't I want that in my life? Why would I not want to have more than what I have instead of living less than what I could be. And I hate to say it, but you know, that's where a lot of Christians are today. You know, they may say they've got it down, you know, they may have this, you know, kind of rap, zap kind of feeling, kind of emotional roller coaster ride, but they're really not there when it comes to, you know, the big issues of life, like when they suddenly get devastated by disease. Or they suddenly get crushed by, you know, the failing of their I believe in healing ministry, you know, or faith healing ministries or whatever it may be that they've misinformation or disinformation themselves on. The reality is Jesus never said that. Jesus said simple things. He was able to talk to the people where they're at. And people wanted what he had to give them. And that's what Christianity doesn't have today. People don't want what we're offering. And they're willing to go the other way. So, I would say, you know, if someone doesn't want what you have, it's probably because you don't have the right information. You are more of a disinformation source and a misinformation place than the reality of being able to say, hey, check it out, man. I'm enjoying my life, man. I'm digging it. You know, how about you? Where are you at? How are you going? You know, here's where I was, and here's where I am, you know, and hey, if your life works for you, go for it. You know, but for me, I'm kind of like thinking of eternity. You know, I, I got my eye on a long distance goal, you know, and I'm heading that direction. I hope you figure that out before you get there. 
Because once you're there, you're already living it. You'll be in eternity. And then you got to deal with God face to face anyways. So hey, let's get the reality of our message down. Let's get the truth of the matter solved. Let's settle the issue instead of getting sidetracked by the abstract information people are putting out there in order to keep you distracted from the main source of what you should be talking about, of who you should be talking about, of where we're going and how we're getting there. Souls that smile. To conquer adverse circumstances, conquer yourself. The answer to the desire of my disciples to follow me was, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. To accomplish much, be much. In all cases, the doing to be well doing must be the mere unconscious expression of the being and well being, <laughs> which actually the doing is from the results of being. You'll have to think about that one. Fear not, fear not, because all is well. Let the day be full of little prayers to me and cares given to me. Little turnings towards me, little mindsets of recognizing I am the living God. I am alive. I am with you. You just can't see me right now, but you can hear me. The smiles of the soul are always visible to the one who's smiling and letting everyone know what he's smiling about because of the genuinity of his smile. You like that word, genuinicity? <laughs> Mine. <laughs> Men call the Father the first cause. Yes, see him as the first cause of every warm ray of sunshine every color in the sunset, every gleam on the water, every sparkle in the night, every beautiful flower, every indeed breath of life. And you know, when you, when you really quit thinking of it as being like out there and really right here, when you just be what you say you are, everyone around you knows. It's obvious because you're weird, <laughs> but you're also wonderful. You know, you're kind of different, kind of strange, but you're happy. And there's nothing that can be said to a happy person except for that joy that seems to bubble out of them. Because people want to be around a joyful person, but I'll be honest with you, even I don't want to be around a miserable one. So, quite frankly, if your religious talk and walk and information and disinformation is all about the misery and the you know stuff and fluff and puff ups you know junk that you got in your trunk you know you know I don't really want to hear it but if you're happy if you're joyful if you're really enjoying what you're doing you know I'm kind of interested you know I kind of look at you and go hey you know what are you doing and it looks like fun and that's where I'm at you see I'm having fun I don't know how to explain it any better than that, except for, man, I'm loving it. I'm digging it, you know. I mean, surf's up, and I'm surfing through this life, enjoying it for all that it's worth. There's lots of things that maybe I could have done, maybe I should have done. But you know what? What I am doing is I'm enjoying what I am doing. And that's the difference between enjoy and employ. A lot of people are employed, but that doesn't mean they're enjoying what they're doing.